Okay, so Lisa Dion, welcome to the Science of Psychotherapy podcast. How are you? I am fabulous. Thank you so much for this invitation to be a part of this. Well, thank you so Hi, much. Hi, Lisa. Nice to see you. Oh, nice to see you too. We're coming from all over the place today. I'm in Brisbane, Australia. Richard, you're in Phoenix. That's hey, Lisa. Right. Lisa, where are you coming from? I am right outside of Boulder, Colorado. So Boulder, Colorado. No, I'm staring at snow out my oh, window. Oh, how nice. How nice. We're sweltering in the heat down here. And so the, the thought of snow is wonderful. <laughs> the thought of heat is wonderful. So we'll oh. just shake that way. <laughs> 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 Phoenix is Phoenix is just somewhere in between. <laughs> um, Lisa, we, um, we're going to touch on a whole bunch of things. I have to profess, I don't know a lot about play therapy, and um, and you're a play therapy guru, so I'm I'm really keen to learn um, all about synergistic play therapy, and and especially your your most recent book, Aggression in Play Therapy, um, which is a really interesting title. So really keen to get into that. Richard yeah, because I was I was quite excited, Lisa. This uh, this time I brought somebody new into the into the podcast because uh, we've known each other for a, a little while. But play is one of a, a most important thing in human behaviour and something that is um, uh, it, it's not we don't get it anymore for some reason or another. And I just love the way you guys work with it. Can we just start with this uh, fabulous Synergistic Play Therapy Institute yes. that teaches this wonderful process you call Synergistic Play Therapy, which leads us to the obvious question, why that fabulous title, Synergistic Play Therapy? Yeah, why, why call it that? So um, well, let's look at the word synergetics because that's, that's the root, um, really. So synergetics was actually um, a word that was coined by Buckminster Fuller, who is a very famous um, a physicist. And someone be thinking, wait, we were, we're talking physics and play therapy? Yes, we are. Um, so the word synergetic really means systems in transformation and really speaks to this idea that um, if you take two systems or multiple systems and you put them together, that what they all create together is so much greater than either what any of them could ever have created individually. And to me, that is the beauty of the therapeutic relationship. It is the synergetic or the synergistic aspect of the relational dance that happens between the therapist and the client um, or the child in, in this case um, that together really creates something so much greater than what the child could have done on their own or the therapist could have done on their own. And, and it really encapsulates all the teachings because so much of synergetic play therapy is really taking interpersonal neurobiology and bringing it to life through a play therapy practice, a play therapy modality. So to me, the word, when I, um, when I came across it, like the hairs stood up on my arms and it gave me goosebumps and, and it was like, that is it. It just felt so right. It's absolutely, no, it is a, it's a beautiful word. And Buckminster Fuller is, is someone uh, that people should get into to try and get a greater understanding of, of, of a lot of things. Uh, and I remember uh, we've done a lot of work uh, in body work, uh, areas called fascia and a few other things. And another one of his great words is tensegrity, mm -hmm. uh, which is the, the, the collection of, of elements that are held together simply by the engagement of the elements and the forces they create within each other, yeah. uh, which is what synergism is all about as well. So, so choosing him as a motivation was, um, and I think is is really important. What Matt and I talk about a lot is the the, the nature of systems and combinations and of ideas, and we have to combine brains. So, uh, you know, we just are so excited about doing that work. Exactly. Well, when I was really looking at what I felt really happens in the playroom um, or with the in the relationship with the client, the word collaboration kept coming to mind. But 
collaborative play therapy just wasn't really getting it for me. Um, and when I looked at like, what, like, what is it? And, and it really was a, the collaboration of parts. So it was like the, you know, my prefrontal cortex collaborating with other aspects of my brain and my breath collaborating with my body and my rhythm collaborating with the rhythm of the client and my prefrontal cortex communicating to the client's prefrontal cortex. And it was just this like beautiful collaborative feeling that emerged for me. And so from there, I, I started to really look at what are other words that have that sense of collaboration attached to it. And that's where I ultimately um, found synergetic. And because I'm a bit of a science nerd uh, myself and physics is something that I love to study, I love Buckminster Fuller. So when it landed and it came together, I, again, I just said, yep, that would be it. <laughs> so, yes. So how does this understanding of uh, complex systems um, help you and guide you and instruct you um, when you're with a client in play therapy? Absolutely. So for me, um, where what feels really important um, for me to really feel within myself and then also when I, when I teach and I train my students is that we're not doing something to. We're engaging with. And I think so much of our training in this field is about doing something to the client. So I learn this protocol and I apply the protocol to the client or I help the client engage in X, Y, and Z or whatever it is. And for me, the, the relational, the systems part, I'm a system, you're a system. We connect, we flow, we, uh, we're communicating on so many levels, some cognitive, you know, mostly nonverbal. And so for me, if we don't think about the therapeutic relationship from the perspective of systems, I really feel like we're missing half of the equation, if not right. more than half of the equation, um, because it, it is, it's the, it's, it's how I as a system and you as a system, how we, how we come together. Um, and then everything that that means. So, uh, in terms of my, uh, my attunement, my, my body language, my attunement, not just with my client, but with myself, my own modulation of my own systems in my own body as a way to support you modulating the systems in your own body. I mean, there's, there's just so many systems that come together to create deep healing that um, I don't really feel like we address at the depth that it deserves to be addressed in our field. We mm, still feel like right. we're too outwardly focused on let's do something to our client. Mm. Yeah, this is this is so much. Uh, I mean, this actually the the presentation I'm doing at the Ericsson Congress uh, tomorrow. Mm -hmm. uh, well, well, you know, soon, depending on when we we put the podcast up. But it's uh, what Ernest Rossi and I uh, and what he's taught me is client responsive, and the the best way to be responsive is in play, where you don't have an overriding, organized, pre-organized framework. Um, or, or rather definitively pre-organised. Because some people, for example, they might say you're playing a game of football or a game of basketball and say that is play. And yes and no, but it's organised play. So how, how much of the framework um, do you find fits into, well, almost, I don't know, I don't want to uh, preempt, but words like improvisation, words like uh, uh, waiting at, uh, and responsive to clients, things like that. So in the play therapy field, there's really two schools of thought. There are approaches that are, they really categorize themselves as directive, which is very much um, therapist led. So I ask the child to do X, Y, and Z. So draw me a picture of. And then there's a whole other school of thought that's about engaging the child in a non-directive approach where the child enters the play space and the child decides naturally where they want to gravitate towards and then you join. Um, in that play space, I believe that there's a time and a place for both. I typically go non-directive. Non-directive tends to be more my style. Um, for a lot of what you're also talking about here is I really trust my clients 
And I really trust that there is a wisdom inside my clients that knows where they need to go far beyond where I think they need to go. And so, and that doesn't matter. I mean, the client could be one years old or my client could be 80 years old. I, I believe in that innate wisdom. And so I really want the client to come in and engage in whatever play feels meaningful for them. So it's spontaneous. It comes from within. It's a, it's automatically um, a congruent expression of where they are in that moment. Um, and then my job is to help facilitate their process from there. Um, so that's really where, where I start. And then sometimes there are some pieces that we target in a more directive kind of, kind of a way, but I really, I really go with let's let's have the play emerge organically um, from the wisdom of the person that is um, you know in the play space. Yeah. And who knows? There are moments sometimes as the therapist when the, the play naturally will arise from from me also. If all of a sudden I have this intuitive uh, urge to start humming a song or to you know move in a particular way or something like that, so I don't also want to limit it to. Uh, I'm just holding space and it's, it's just the client again, back to, yes, the client is um, playing. I am responsive to whatever it is that they're doing, but I also get to play too. And I also <laughs> get to, to, to interact and be part of that dynamic as well. Okay. That's wonderful. As, as you're talking, I'm, I'm just jotting down a few, um, a few words here that come to mind. So self-awareness as, um, as a therapist is obviously huge self-awareness and intuition. Um, and as part of the system and your awareness as a catalyst to bring out the wisdom of the client that will be with. Yeah. So in synergetic play therapy training, um, the majority of the training in our programs is about developing the, the, the therapist. Yep. It's not focused on a technique or, you know, do this when the client does this or whatever it is. It is a, a deep dive into the world of the clinician and how can the clinician develop greater degrees of relationship with the parts of themselves. So how do they begin to trust themselves more? How do they listen to their intuition a little bit more? How do they begin to, one of my favorite words is interoception, which is one of the, right? Yeah. I, love, I, love, I just love <laughs> interoception, um, you know, which is teaching them how to fine tune and listen to their the sensory body talking and the cues of their own body. Because I really believe that if a therapist is not um, in a, a reflective state when they are working with their client and they're not tracking what's happening in their own physiology, they're actually missing the data. Right? They're, they're, they're missing the information. They're not... I mean, we know this from the brain. I can't read your cues unless I'm attuned to me. I have to be present within myself first to be able to then attune to you. Otherwise, I, I, I miss you. I'll I'll mis misread what I'm what I'm what I'm seeing rather than sensing you. I'll be thinking you, not sensing right. you. And, yep. uh, and sensing you is really where the where the information is, not thinking you. <laughs> So this sounds yeah. like great training for anybody, regardless of whatever um, therapeutic technique they're using. Absolutely. I mean, we talk about it as synergetic play therapy, but my probably the greatest um, uh, compliment that I have received about synergetic play therapy is that it's actually a way of being, which I love because Carl Rogers is also one of the people that I love. And then he has his book called a way of being. And it's, it really is that it's a, yeah. in some ways it's a philosophy. It's a way to orient to yourself. It's a way of orienting to other. And so the, the principles and the tenets of synergetic play therapy are easily applied into the adult world um, and applied to, to parenting and things outside the therapeutic context um, as as well. It was applied to relationship. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, which is so so important. For me, uh, this is just, of course, this is the way it should be because my uh, first 25 years of training for psychotherapy was as a professional actor. Mm -hmm. And all you're talking about is what it is to be an actor. And I, I quite seriously argue that we should do a national service of six months as an actor 
where you learn to be people uh, rather than perhaps control people or, or, or other things. And all these skills of, of inner sensitivity is exactly what we did in acting school. Mm. Um, uh, and uh, so it's, I think that this type of thing was in the village. It was, it was in historic societies uh, uh, that they, they would sing and dance and act and play and storytell as a natural part of culture. And we've removed that. So we need to, and it's not so much retrain, but reopen uh, everybody to the experience. And this is one of the things that I particularly love about the work you do. Thank yeah. you. I, I, I completely agree with you. I think we've really, um, we have forgotten how to play. Uh, I think we have um, conditioned ourselves not to move because and we've conditioned ourselves not to be silly and we've conditioned ourselves uh, not to be big and we've conditioned, our, not that that's always what play looks like, but it's an aspect of play that, uh, you know, it's not okay when you become an adult, you, you're you not supposed to act that way anymore and play has to look more organized like cards at a table, um, you know, so I, I do and, and it's so funny because I think I mean, I watch adults and the moment that adults get freedom and they are away from those constructs, they play, they right. play, they laugh, they're yeah. silly. They start to express when they actually give themselves permission. But as long as we have the shoulds in our head or we're in this idea that there's a social standard that says, no, we have to act this way. We really limit what our body innately wants to do. Yeah. Yeah. And so your training will allow people to then explore more of the, of this aspect of being. Well, I think that's why, um, the combination of getting, so let me say it this way in the training, we're working on everything from authenticity to understanding what's happening in the body and nervous system regulation and attunement, all those things, but we're doing it playing with kids. Right. So you already have permission to play. So it's like this double amazing thing where, wow, I get to express myself through play and I get to develop a relationship with myself at the same time. How cool. So yeah. therapists report not just their practices shifting, but they actually report that they as beings feel like they shift. And then that shifts relationships and that their lives actually start to change over time because they're just giving themselves more permission to be and to uh, embrace what that, what that means for them and how cool that they get to do it through play. Yeah, that's wonderful. Yeah. Uh, Lisa, now can we um, make a shift and talk about aggression in the yeah. playroom? What Absolutely. is that about? And what was the, what's the motivation for um, this book of yours? Yeah. So aggression and play therapy. Um, so the motivation really started. So my play therapy journey started back in 2002 and I opened my practice back in 2003. And when I, um, opened my practice, I, um, I simultaneously had a job with our version of social services yeah. and, um, and I would go into schools and I would go into different situations but what that meant is that I was often given the children who were struggling the most. So yep. I had a lot of trauma in my caseload would be a, a way of saying that. Yep. And what I found was that the sessions were very aggressive. There was a lot of aggression, a lot of overwhelm that was happening um, in, the, in the play itself. And in my play therapy training at the time, I was told that if you're given a role in play therapy, so for example, if someone says, okay, you be the teacher, I'll be the kid, that all of a sudden now I become this teacher, okay? And yep. you just sort of go for it and you pretend and you, you're the teacher. Sure. Um, nobody taught me about how to manage what was happening inside of me as I was being the teacher or what to do with uh, the activation in my own nervous system when the, chi when the child is now playing aggressively towards me or in front of me or whatever it is. And so um, what I found was that I was exhausted. I would spend my day in trauma with my own nervous system activated because I'm a human being and your nervous system gets activated when the aggression happens in front of you. And then I would leave my day and just feel like I, I just, I was 
irritable. I was exhausted. I wanted to sleep. It was, it was, it was so much. So yeah. even from the beginning, my body was showing signs of compassion fatigue, like, like within, you know, two years of being in the field and, um, in the field of play therapy, longevity is not high for right. working by trauma. Burnout happens really quickly in our field. Right. So, um, I had an experience is actually the very first story in how I start the book. So I had an experience with a five-year-old. I was in a school. I had um, pulled him from class. We're in the counseling room. And in his play, he wanted to have a sword fight. So we're having a sword fight. And again, I was taught, okay, you just have a sword fight. So I'm having my sword fight. I'm not regulating. I'm not breathing. I'm not grounding. I'm not modulating. Because again, no one told me anything about that. Yeah. I wasn't regulating him, had no idea what it meant to be an external regulator, like none of none of this. And I started to flood. I started to get emotionally overwhelmed. And when I did and I got ungrounded, um, he actually grabbed an object and hit me in the head with it. Wow. Yep. And exactly. So I actually got yeah. hurt in it. Yeah. And so after that experience, um, I started to get curious about, wait, why am I getting hurt in the playroom? Because I wasn't the only one. I'd also heard stories from my colleagues about people getting hurt in the playroom or it's really intense or what do we do with this? And we have to stop the aggression and all of that. Yeah. And, um, and so I started to research and I couldn't find anything mm. and it baffled me absolutely baffled me that aggression, which is one of the number one things that we see in a play therapy context, yep. and nobody was writing about it. People would write about trauma. Um, there was a there was one book out there um, on aggression, but it was written like 20 years ago. So nobody was really coming at this from a, what is aggression? How do we work it? How do we actually make it therapeutic? Um, because what I was also finding was any thing that I was reading about aggression outside of it was about behavioral modification. How do you stop it? How do you control it? How do you make the kids stop doing it? And then my mind just went, no, 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 that's not, that doesn't work with it. Mm. How do you work with it? How do you integrate it? How do you welcome it in such a way where it actually becomes a healing part of the child's journey? Because there's a reason why it's coming into the therapeutic space. So this book was written, it's the book that I wish I had had, <laughs> um, but this book was really written for any clinician who is working with a child um, and aggression shows up, again, mm -hmm. either directly in the play or they're observing it or it's verbally, the child's verbally aggressive. Um, and the, the focus of the book is not to make it stop. The, the focus of the book really is how do I work with it in such a way where it actually becomes a deeply, deeply therapeutic experience for the child, yep. where the child actually gets to integrate it in such a way where they actually get to repattern their nervous system. So I, I look at it at that level. I look yep. at it as um, an extension of nervous system dysregulation. And, and I'm guessing we, sorry, Richard, I'm, I'm just guessing no, so you go. That we could extrapolate a lot of this out um, beyond working with the child and in play therapy, because this is about being self-regulated and being a regulator in the dyad, right? So we can all probably learn a lot from, from this work. The surprising feedback from this book have been the emails I have received from parents that said, you actually wrote a parenting book as well. Wow, and you that's awesome. You just actually yeah. helped me understand how to work with my child at home when my child is having an aggressive moment or that's because that happens at home too. So um, that wasn't my intention, but I'm so grateful that that's been an extension of the book and that parents are finding it helpful too. So tell yeah. us a little, sorry, I just, just, I'm interested. Keep to on know, going, Matt. Sorry, you gave us a little bit of an insight as to what it was like for you before you did this, you know, work of discovery and, and, and wrote the book and now, um, what is it like for you and the ones that you're training um, in terms of, you know, this being exhausted and, you know, the propensity for burnout in this whole field? I'm imagining there's been a huge shift. 
huge, huge. We actually have a, um, we just submitted a, uh, a research paper on this. We were measuring um, compassion fatigue levels with therapists that are using synergetic play therapy. And what we actually found was not only is it mitigating compassion fatigue, but it's actually increasing their energy. And wow. it's actually helping okay. them actually, their presence level is actually going up, um, even when they're working with, with trauma. I'll, I'll share a little bit about, about why, which is really the, the crux. And I mentioned this word earlier, external regulator, which is a word from uh, Dr. Alan Shore's work. And it's really um, the role that the synergetic play therapist works to embody. So this understanding that when the child is in the play and they're working on something that they perceive as challenging, their, their nervous system is simultaneously getting activated and getting dysregulated. And, um, and this child is, is now in lower, lower parts of their brain. And, um, and what it's really looking at is in that moment, what the child needs is an external regulator. Need, this child needs somebody to help them be able to modulate and integrate the intensity. That's the intensity that they're experiencing inside. Um, another way of saying it is to help them move towards towards the sensations, towards the thoughts, towards the feelings um, in a way where they're not moving outside their window of tolerance. They can stay in their window of tolerance and they can integrate it. And so the therapist really becomes that external regulator. And the therapist does that first and foremost through their own mindfulness through their own, through their, through their own grounding, um, and then through their own breath, yeah. through their own movement, through their own congruency, their own authenticity. Um, they, they may even, you know, certain reflections they make um, to ground the energy in the room, but they're really working on how do I modulate when the aggression um, kicks in or really any emotion or whatever that's coming into the room. But, um, but how do I help this child move towards recognizing that you don't integrate unless you move towards. Yeah. And part of the activation is because it's been too scary to move towards. It was too overwhelming in the first place. So I need support in being able to, to move towards it and integrate it and realize I'm safe. I'm okay if I feel this, if I, if, I move, if I move into this. And so in order for the therapist to hold that, they are simultaneously regulating themselves. Yeah. So as the intensity shows up in the room and the therapist begins to breathe, the therapist, you know, internally names what's going on for themselves, or the therapist begins to, you know, there's many ways you can modulate, modulate energy. Um, the therapist is doing what I call one foot in, one foot out, which is kind of the, the golden phrase that I offer the, the clinicians that you must be willing to feel the dysregulation for attunement. That's the one foot in, but you simultaneously have to activate your ventral state and right. to be regulated, which is one foot out. Uh -huh. So it's the development of the capacity in the clinician to be regulated and dysregulated simultaneously. Yeah. Yeah. I'm in it with you and I'm holding something larger at the same, at the same time. It's that dual awareness, dual attention. And, and because of that, the therapist isn't walking away exhausted. Mm. Mm. Because they're modulating, which is different than if I'm not practicing that level of attention and I'm not regulating my nervous system, my nervous system's um, reacting because that's what the nervous system does. And so I'm either in some version of a fight or flight or shut down or whatever that happens um, in the sessions in the play, but I haven't done anything about it. Right. So right. then I leave the session and my own nervous system's dysregulated. Yeah. And then I go into the next session and then I do it again. And then I have like five of those. And then at the end of the day, I wonder why I'm tired. Yeah. Yeah. Because I never regulated. I never yeah. modulated it. I never, uh, I never connected with myself through it. Yeah. I was just in it. Yeah. Yes. It's a, it's a really, uh, again, just replying on the theme of before with the acting, this is exactly what you needed to do there. Mm. Uh, uh, I, I remember a, a, a play I did where, where uh, I was a, sort of a Jack the Rippery type character, and I actually strangled my girlfriend, uh, who was the, the female lead in the show. Uh, you know, eight performances a week for several weeks, and it was a really. I remember that one for a number of reasons because of the incredible intensity that occurred, um, 
what occurred during the play, which is quite interesting, what occurred after the play when, um, when we uh, re-entered the normal space, so therefore we also had a very intense relationship um, afterwards. Uh, but it was uh, one of the really important times where we learned that the importance of some of these efforts of, of acting and playing characters and being in, in frameworks is actually it helps you find uh, yourself. You actually you set up this place to go to go back to. And what um, I finally found out when learning with Ernie Rossi and then starting to look at systems theory, and it's also in quantum theory as well, the ability for us to be the observer and operator at the same time, and which is the sort of technical term for exactly what you're saying. Exactly. And, and that's what we did. Uh, and I don't know why we don't learn this in, um, in our therapeutic training. Yeah, uh, but I don't either. You know, but it, but but thankfully, uh, we can go on and learn uh, this afterwards, and eventually it'll it'll get incorporated in courses. But um, so because you uh, you you do certainly the work with the with the you know your association and with your organisation, but you also lecture at other conferences and and other ongoing education opportunities for therapists. Absolutely. You know, um, someone once approached me and said, uh, asked me. Because they were they were feeling it through what I was saying, but they asked me, "Is um, is this a spiritual thing for you?" And I said, um, "It's a spiritual practice in and of itself, because every time I enter the playroom, I have to have a relationship with myself. Right. Every time I'm with my client, my client, in a sense, is asking me to look." Look at this part of you that activates when I say this. Look at this part of you that activates when I do this. And it's this ongoing experience of, okay, how do I develop a relationship with this and with this and with this sensation and that thought? And how do I stay connected to myself and not get swept up in it while I'm holding space for other, which goes back to, again to the dual awareness and what you were just, um, what you were just sharing. It's a, it's a, it's a beautiful way to develop the self, an absolutely extraordinary way to develop the self, um, which I'll also say is an interesting thing because in our field, I hear so much, I'm going to use the word fear around, like the therapist shouldn't be doing their work while they're, the therapist's own process it really needs to be a separate experience from what's happening in the playroom or in the in the counseling space. And as much as I try to understand that, I just keep coming back to how is that possible? <laughs> how, how, how do I separate myself from what's happening in the moment with my client? I mean, all of me is with me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I don't, exactly. don't know how to do that. I, I didn't learn that one very well. <laughs> yes, but it, it's it's the terrible thing about our society that uh, it, it exists in business. You know, hang your life uh, uh, on the post at the door. Come in, do what you need to do to make me whatever it is you need to make me. Then pick yeah. up your, put your coat back on as you leave. And of course, it is very difficult to take the coat off and very difficult to put it back on because it's a traumatic experience is a, a lot of the work I'm doing. And I'm sure, uh, you know, this is what you've been alluding to here. And this, I mean, this aggression, uh, uh, my daughter's done a lot of work on domestic violence, written a fantastic book about it and talking about the central role of shame. Mm -hmm. uh, and that, that very often that that aggression is just preceded by a sense of shame of, of doing things. And that's an outward escape from the, the framework, or uh, it's also you know, so uh, pro projecting things outwards and so on and so forth. And 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 therapists have got to be very careful that they don't get caught up in that themselves. Mm. Absolutely, mm. absolutely. To your point there with the aggression, um, in in the work we, we talk about boundaries. I actually promote uh, promote. I was trying to throw it. Teach setting boundaries maybe in a little bit of a different way than some play therapy uh, models, which I'm happy to share if you want. Um, but for me, when the, when the aggression kicks in and the therapist responds with, we don't do that in here, or we don't act like that in here, or that kind of a thing, it actually reinforces the shame that you're just talking about. The yeah. aggression was coming. It's not like the kid went, you know what, at exactly 12 minutes into the session today, I am going to become aggressive. Uh, <laughs> 
doesn't work that way. It's an extension of something that has arisen inside the client. And so if we, um, if we step in and we shut it down, the, the way I teach it, it's like you've got a, a, a fast moving current in a river, right? Because aggression, it's, it's big energy. It's a fast moving current. If I throw a dam down in the river, the water goes off to the side. So now we get really interesting sideways outbursts of, um, of anger. Um, but some of the water actually turns back in on itself, right? which is shame, right? It comes back mm. it comes back this way. Mm. And so, and I think that's a really great visual. So what I uh, try to teach therapists to do is we're not going to throw down the dam. We're actually just going to quickly build another river so that we can help some of the energy go this way. So yeah. that we don't actually want to stop the flow. We want to help the energy move in a way where it's a bit more contained so that the therapist can remain present with it. So if the therapist can remain present and hold it, the aggression can stay because it's, it's running its course. It's doing its thing as you're working on, you know, what's also underneath the aggression um, coming out. So we do a lot of acknowledge and redirect. So right. like, wow, that's really big. Show me another way. Oh, that's so important for you to express today. Show me another way. So I'm acknowledging so that the child knows that what they're doing is not bad or wrong. Yeah. And then I'm simply saying, look, I want to stay in a relationship with you. Let's just shift just a little bit here so I can stay connected, uh, connected with you because I want to be in this with you. And um, there's very few kids that won't, just naturally go that way because they they want that they they want the yeah. connection yeah and, and and as you're saying you know you're uh, obviously this is this is about kids but you know i don't work with kids i work with adults but they can be just as dysregulated and um you know emotionally dysregulated and i see this totally applicable to i i need your book i don't do play <laughs> <laughs> I, I need this <laughs> Well, it's in a personal neurobiology. It's just in the framework of it. So yeah, yeah, every, absolutely. everything in it is applicable to yeah. anyone, anyone <laughs> so, with a nervous system. <laughs> yes. So Lisa, um, apart from going and buying the book, Aggression and Play Therapy, where else yes. can people go um, to get more information? So synergeticplaytherapy.com is the website for, mm -hmm. the, for the Institute. And we have... Um, uh, I have everything in there. So the people that like to read, we've got the blogs on there. Um, yep. We also have uh, my podcast. So my podcast is called Lessons from the Playroom. They can download that on iTunes if they want to add another podcast um, to their to their list. Cool. Um, and then we also have our courses. So we have everything from one hour courses to if people are really interested in, in synergetic play therapy, we've got online courses where people can access them anywhere in the world. And then we have certification programs and kind of everything, everything in between based on what feels meaningful for the student. Wonderful. And, we'll and throw a whole bunch of course as well that you do this, this uh, nine month uh, program, which is, which is really terrific. You can really get involved if you want to. Right. Yes. And the, one of the most popular intro courses is a six month online course. Mm -hmm. But what's really cool about it is that, um, uh, they also get paired with a, um, a consultant. So it's not just taking a course. You actually also get to talk to somebody about what you're learning and right away talk about how to apply it into your caseload, which I just think is a really cool gem for an online program because you get you just get the support through the whole, through the whole experience. Awesome. Awesome. Lisa, we're sort of coming up to the end of, um, <laughs> end of our chat. Is there anything that you'd like to leave us with? Any last thoughts? Yes, it's like so okay to be you in the playroom. <laughs> okay, awesome. <laughs> I mean, it is. It's so we're we're so af afraid of ourselves, right? And we don't need mm. to be afraid of ourselves. Um, we 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 show up with an intention to heal and an intention to do good, and then we have relationship. And sometimes it's messy, and then you do the repair, but you show up and. Uh, it's okay to be authentic. It's okay to be real. And in fact, it's the thing that the child is craving the most. They, they want, yeah. I'll, I'll, leave, I'll leave this very, this very last thought. What children want most in this world is someone just to teach them how to do human. Right. Beautiful. It's beautiful. Yeah, it's wonderful. absolutely. And all the colors of that. Beautiful.
Mm-hmm. Lisa Dion, it's been a pleasure having you on the show. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks. Thank, Thank you. you. And we'll, uh, we'll catch up with you somewhere on the trail. Beautiful. Love it. <laughs> okay. Bye for now. Bye-bye.